the abundant life that we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, where it says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give them life and to give it abundantly. Having an abundant life, a happy life, is connected to our natural created being. We are supposed to be happy. It is a natural state of God's creation. And he has given us plenty of things in scripture to be able to focus on to help, help us to have happiness. And because uh, what I see when I look around, I can see people that are just persevering through life, but with a downcast spirit. It's like, well, even going through difficulty, we can have happiness. And so today I want to talk to you about what are the keys in the Bible to achieving this better state of happiness. You know, if the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and to get you down and to tear you away and to pull you apart from Jesus, we need to acknowledge that and that, that those things are enemies. When people steal from you, when people are evil against you, those are things that are in line with Satan and not God. Think about it. God made creation and he made it perfect. And by him making it perfect, that means that, you know, humanity at one point was perfectly emotionally as well too, as well as spiritually. And then something changed and life got difficult. So I'm not going to say you're going to be able to be happy in every circumstance all over, but we should be marked as people who are happy even when we go through struggles. Because James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 says that uh, consider pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so you can be mature and complete. So yes, sometimes God allows you to go through difficulty so that you can level up to be able to handle the next thing. But he says during that, consider it a pure joy. God's taken us to school. He's letting us learn. So we can be joyous in a difficult time. We learn in the book of Acts that the disciples were told not to talk about the name of Jesus, but they kept doing it to their own punishment. The authorities captured them and said, you're not supposed to be doing that. We told you not to. And they beat them with many blows. And they left rejoicing, being very happy that they got to suffer for the sake of Christ. So happiness does not mean doing a lotto dance. In fact, actually, the reason why so many people look to money to help them to become happy is because money is a mask of depression. Think about it. A lot of times that uh, when we do things to alleviate our depression or our bad mood that we are in are oftentimes not um, completely holy. They're often things that we should not do. And if we find ourselves in patterns of sin, we should ask ourselves, are we depressed? That's a really good question that's for me to ask you. I ask it myself frequently. And so let's ask the thing, you know, sin and depression actually kind of go in hand in hand. So not only do we see that happiness is part of our created order, so is holiness. So happiness and holiness go hand in hand. And it is unmistakable. I could go on all kinds of different uh, verses, and I'm going to go through quite a few of them here now to talk about and highlight the connection that God wants us to be happy and he wants us to be holy and that those two things really do go together. Ecclesiastes 2.26 says, The person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. You make known the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. I keep my eyes always on the Lord, with him at my right hand, and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Take the light in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Blessed is the people of whom this is true. Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some of those to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The prospect of the righteous is joy, but the hopes of the wicked come to nothing. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So we see here, not only that the holiness is linked to happiness in a great many of these, but that God is the supplier of it. So again, if we're going closer to God in relationship, happiness and holiness are part of God's attributes, so we're going to kind of get those too. Kind of like the same with when we get peace and other uh, good attributes. The closer we get to God, the more we are with Him and rely on Him, the more we uh, have His radiance in our lives. 
and happiness is one of them. So we've seen through many of these scriptures that we can be happy in the presence of the Lord, that we can be happy when we celebrate and give people things that they don't have but we can supply, and be thankful that we get to be givers in this nation, in this day and age, and to be thankful that we can uh, rejoice even if people come against us in the name of the Lord, because we know that on that fateful day, you know what? He's, he's going to make it even more happy. Heaven is going to be really happy, like all the time. It's going to be pretty cool to never be depressed again, never have a low day, always for it to be just increasing glory of God in His, in his incredible wonderfulness. I don't even know how to quite describe it. Just as I've been going through all these verses, it just is highlighting how big the Lord is. It's highlighting how happy He is, that even if uh, you know, my joints don't always, uh, you know, work well and things like that that I know that I can rejoice because my God loves me just in the status of who I am as, as his child, that, that I'm just loved by him and so are you and that that should do something in us. But the connection we see again to this, um, not only to holiness, is there's a, uh, you would have noticed in there, God's countenance how God looks upon us, that when we desire him, when we look out to him, when we try to go towards him, it says he puts his face towards us. That's in fact kind of one of the pinnacle things to the blessing out of number six, which is may he lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. You know, it's like may the Lord bless you and keep you. Like he wants to bless us. He wants to keep us. He wants to destroy the work of the devil. That's what he said he came to do. And all the destruction that is in our and around our lives is part of that. So now I'm not saying that you come to the Lord so that you can get happiness. You know, there's too many other false preachers who've gone out there who've tried to bait Christianity with uh, felt needs. But I would be remiss to say, you know what? There's incredible benefits to go to the God who's got everything and can do anything. So I really want to encourage you with that. Go to the Lord because you love him, because he has offered a salvation, that he has done what nobody else could do, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. That alone should make us happy too, that he died for us even when We weren't even looking to be saved, even when we weren't even knowing we needed to be saved. He's a God worth worshiping. And these are the benefits that come on top of that. So this is not a way to earn salvation. You don't earn happiness like earning salvation. Jesus gives it to us freely. So all the more we should worship when we have a happy day or happy moment. You know, and the Bible mentioned there, you know, if someone has something good of praiseworthy, then give praise and thanks to God. So when we are thankful, when we find ourselves being thankful, when we find ourselves in a good situation, let us then make sure we give God the appropriate thanks, and that is our praise and our worship, because He is worth it. And then our joy will be continually made complete. So those who set their countenance towards God, He sets His blessing countenance towards us and His relationship. And on the flip side, those who spurn the Lord, God's like, you know what, you're going to toil and you're not going to enjoy anything. It's just going to be miserable. So there's a consequence there. So I'm not talking again about works righteousness or if you sin, you're going to lose your salvation. But there's just a very practical thing in God's economy that, uh, that he will bless those who do what is right and that he will set his face against those who do what is wrong. And that means no blessing. You know, I need blessings to get through every day. And so I want to encourage you with that. It's like holiness is really important. So there's reasons why holiness leads to happiness, notwithstanding everything else I have just said. Well, there's common sense things with holiness. There's a lot of practical advice in the Bible. So if we're seeking to obey God and everything, and Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. So we should want to do what is right based out of what we should be doing that is right. But realizing that when we get the happiness that goes along with it, that's great. You know, the Bible says that when you have plenty, make sure that others are well supplied, that we're told to tithe. And there's a lot of people who forsake their blessings on monetary things, and the devil comes in and steal, kills, and destroys, and things don't last. Oh, that's a real spiritual thing that we learn in the book of Malachi. Just because it's in the Old Testament does not mean it is not applicable that we should be generous people. And he even says it, Malachi says it, this is what the Lord says, that there, your, your purse strings uh, have come loose. You, your, your money bags have holes in them, kind of referencing that like money just slips through your fingers. It's because you're robbing God, so he is not keeping the locusts away anymore. So you're having to work harder. You're actually, by thinking you're saving by not giving to the Lord, you're, it's actually costing you much more. So many of the effects uh, are spiritual in nature, and some of them are physical in nature. Again, the Lord says that we should prepare for a rainy day, uh, not by being gluttonous. So it's one, being generous to the Lord, but also being generous to your future in case tough times come. For those who have saved up for the winter, guess what? They have food all winter long. Now, thankfully, we've got superstores, but I mean, back in the day, you used to have to prepare all summer long in order to have food all winter long. And so we do that with money. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we can't really do that with food individually, so we save money for a rainy day. And then when that rainy day comes, we don't have to worry. You know, so there's some common sense things that will affect us. We know that if we don't lie and we do above board business practices and we are honorable to our employers and to others, then guess what? Well, we don't get written up at work or we don't lose a contract or you don't get audited or you don't like, you know, so there's a lot of common sense blessing and peace that comes from living holy because nobody's going to come after you because you're the one that does things that are right. You're reliable. It builds your reputation too, because people see you as holy, they'll see you as trustworthy. Now, if you're all holier than thou and with a bad attitude thinking you're better than anybody else, well, that's gotta be humbled and that's not really gonna lead you to happiness either. Status should not be something that uh, we seek in order to make us happy, that we humble ourselves before the Lord and then God will lift us up in the proper order and the proper time. And so there's, again, many more uh, just common sense ways of just living right just avoids a whole lot of trouble. You know, we're told to obey uh, some of our earthly masters, so long as it doesn't conflict with the Lord. So guess what? I get to live because I don't drive 500 miles an hour down the road. You know, so safety is, again, more common sense. And then there's some spiritual things where God literally will put adversaries in your way because we are going down a very wrong path. Now, that might sound punitive, and sometimes it might be, except the reason why I don't really teach much on that is because you don't really know what, what the reason is if, unless the Lord specifically tells you. But most of the time, uh, the pattern that we see in Scripture is that when God allows difficulty to come the Christian's way, it is A, for us to have a witness in a dark place. B, it is for us to grow in our ability uh, for what God has called us next. Or C, it could be that He's wanting to stop us from harming ourselves. So he's got to do something unpleasant in our life to stop us from going somewhere even worse. So uh, oftentimes, God might not be punishing you, per se, but disciplining you or helping you to not fall away any further or to even just simply level up and to have a, a voice in the middle of a dark place. So and through many of those verses too, we learned even what happiness is. It's a countenance of awe of God and just generally well-being despite our circumstances. And that even when we do have extra good circumstances, we praise the Lord. And so we can say, what are other ways that we can be holy? Well, the Bible's full of ways to be holy. One of them, guess what, by the way, is morals. Most people would say the word holiness. We would think of our personal piety. We would think of like the don't kill, don't steal, uh, don't let the sun go down on your anger, um, be nice to people, you know, don't gossip about people. We would say that to, to honor the elderly amongst us because they're the ones that got us this far. Train up children in the way that they should go so that when they're older, they won't turn from it. You know, there's so many things about morals that we learn in scripture, but did you know that that is only about half of what the word holiness means? To do what is right, to follow God's commands of our personal piety. And what I'm about to say next is really gonna highlight why the church exists as a group, a body of believers because people think they can be holy on their own, so therefore I don't need to go to church, I don't need to gather with other Christians in order to be a moral Christian. And the answer is, you're right 90% of the time. But there's one thing that, uh, one thing that you're disobeying if you isolate yourselves completely. And now if you're living in a very remote place and there's nobody else around, I guess that's different. Or if you're in a jail cell, persecuted for your faith, that's a bit different too. But where possible and we don't, we should understand that other people are going to annoy us. Other people, guess what? The whole world is full of broken people, including those in the church. We're just saved and God is perfecting us. And in the middle of that, there's going to be interpersonal conflicts. But the church should be the best place to resolve those. And if you've ever been hurt by the church and you haven't uh, been to Regal yet, I want to encourage you to come in and just uh, work with us as we seek the Lord, as we seek to become better tomorrow than we are today, and praying that today we're better than we were yesterday. But to know that isolation is not what God wants of the Christian. He wants us to work. Yes, he wants us to have a personal morality. And we do need to pursue that. And Jesus said that actually quite emphatically when he teached. And he said, uh, take the log out of your own eye before you go to try to take the speck of dirt out of your brother's. So that is the approach that we take when we ever need to confront anybody is, well, guess what? Most of the time we're just focused on our own holiness. And guess what happens? When a whole group of people is focused on trying to grow closer to the Lord, nobody has sand that needs to be picked out because we're all busy make, taking our own logs out of our eyes. And we grow a nice Christian community when we do that. But I'm going to read to you out of Hebrews chapter 12, the first two verses there, and to really show that we, we shouldn't be on our own and that we have a mission that God has called us to. 
So remember that why Peter and James and John were able to rejoice even after they got whipped was because they knew they were part of the mission and there was a greater good, that they got to testify about Jesus Christ to the Sanhedrin. That was the Jewish ruling council of the day. So they didn't consider that to be a negative. And so if we don't have the vision of the church in mind, when negative things come our way, they're going to be like, well, this is impacting my life in a negative way. But if you know, okay, I went through that heartbreak or that difficulty with work or whatever you may have gone through in the past, that's going to make you better for the kingdom. It might not even be better for you financially uh, or even emotionally for the most part into the, into the future. But if it benefits the kingdom, then we can rejoice and be happy that God has used us to be able to be a part of his plan. So let's read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So even look at this. Jesus is asking us to act in kind. Even though we don't buy our own salvation, he purchased it. He wants us to act like him for the joy set out before him, the mission, not his personal gain. It's actually his personal loss. You know, Jesus did hang up his divinity, as it were, when he came to earth, which means he felt that as any other ordinary man would have. He could have called on legions of angels, but he suffered and he died in an extraordinarily gruesome way that none of us will ever have to endure. And he did it for us because he wants to be with us. He wanted to redeem us from the road to hell that we were on. He wants to lavish us with his great gifts. He wants to do life together and not just sit around. Yes, there will be a feast, but there's also going to be a society in heaven. And we will each have perfect, happy roles within that. And ultimately, because he wants to be with us, it was the joy set out before him to knowing that one day that he's going to be wrapping his arms around you and that he's going to be doing life eternally with you and me, that he had that picture in his mind, that he was able to go to the cross and pay the ultimate sacrifice. He rose again on the third day to prove that he had power over life and death. And he promised to give us the Holy Spirit, and so he did at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was unleashed onto the church where they went out with great joy and with great power. And Lord willing, we will do so too. The Lord gives us the Holy Spirit to enhance and enable us to do ministry, to be able to help us to be holy in both ways, both moral and with activities that are good. That as we, each of us, the Holy Spirit has given us gifts, that we each have something to give uh, for the communal good. We all can't do everything, but together we can. This is why isolationists and keeping ourselves away without proper reason uh, is not good because I need you and you need me and we need to be together. So as we grow into the future, let us see what the Lord can do in us. And we're just going to pray that, you know what, if we can just be happy as we grow in our holiness and our desire to see that the, that the gospel that came to us doesn't stay with us. It's going to go out from us. It's going to be powerful. And more people will get to be a part of God's fellowship forever. And so with that, just as last takeaway of knowing that we can be so happy about realizing that sin can entangle us and sin causes us to go down and to be depressed. Don't let the things of this world kind of just blow you around like a ship tossed at the sea. God is in control, but we need to have an, an agreeable spirit. You know, Psalm 51 says, Lord, give me a willing spirit to follow you because we do have a free will. So I want to encourage you. Some of the sins that so easily entangle us are from two reasons. One, you might be feeling low and you're self-medicating in a way that is not proper. And it's not getting you where you need to go. So just even doing holiness, even doing the holy things you know are right, even when you don't quite feel good, you'll watch those shackles break off you and you'll watch your father get close to you. And the second is, you know what, put the rudder in. If you're just being blown around with your sail up, put the rudder in and chart a course, even against hard winds. Most people I see that just kind of live one day to the next, they live paycheck to paycheck, they live minute by minute, and there's no real vision to, to their lives. And I'm not saying that about um, uh, just a certain subset of people, I just say that as in general, when we look at statistics, when we find out uh, you know, people across the world, what habits are, uh, let's not be one of those. Let us be assertive. Let us know that God has put us here so we have a role and that we can humbly assert ourselves to say, sin, you've come this far, but no further. 
I'm going to stop self-medicating. I'm going to go to the house of the Lord. I'm going to meet with other Christians and I'm going to pray and I'm going to work on my personal holiness and I'm going to find my gift and use it. And we are going to have a happy, awesome time while we do so and while expanding the kingdom. Because why wouldn't we want to expand God's kingdom and have people coming from darkness into his marvelous light? This is what drives us to know that, you know, we're told to have patience, but we get to have happy patience while we wait for the day for Jesus to return. But he said he's waiting until the last one. Who believes, believes. So let's go speed his coming by doing life together, loving on one another.